Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Good morning, Rocky Hammond Bells Falls, and welcome to the feed. It's Mike and Marty. Here we are, May 10th. Uh, spring has sprung. It's May. beautiful. Oh, it's amazing. Um, today we're going to be joined by Dr. Alexis Chesney. She's joining us from Georgia. We're going to be talking about um, this is another one of those um, Sojourns highlight days we've been doing. Mm-hmm. And Provider so she's going con- Yeah, Sojourn Spotlight. And she's going to be talking about uh, ticks and tick borne illnesses and what we can do to, um, like, understand what we need to do about that but first marty with the local events yeah so i have a i apologize i have a very abbreviated version today and i don't have slides it was just one of those mornings yes (laughs) at the bells falls opera house it is the second week of guardians of the galaxy 3 that will be playing until may 23rd and the classic movie tonight is the goonies that is sponsored by new hampshire mechanical motion parts and assemblies and i believe they're a new a new sponsor to the classic movie um, sponsorship. So congratulations and thank you for for being willing to sponsor a classic movie. Great. So not only did all the plants and the flowers kind of pop this weekend with the sun, but so did the ticks. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So this is very timely. It's a really good time for Alexis to join us. So welcome, Alexis. And um, let's see. uh, Alexis. Hi, thank you. Hi. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your practice and how you uh, work with Sojourns? Absolutely. Well, first, happy Lyme Disease Awareness Month. That's oh, May. So as you said, as spring has sprung, so have the ticks. So it's very timely. Um, yes, I'm a naturopathic doctor at Sojourns Community Health Clinic. And I lived and worked up uh, in Vermont for 13 years and just recently moved to Savannah, Savannah, Georgia. So I am joining you from uh, down here where it's uh, a little warmer. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And we have ticks uh, probably more year round than than up there. So, um, but we're gonna be focusing on Vermont and New England today. And I'm really excited to be able to educate you about ticks and tick bite prevention. Okay, Um, so tell us a little bit about, because there are various kinds of ticks, right? And and some are more benign than others. And um, how should, what should we, what should we be looking for? I guess. Yeah, in your area, um, the black legged tick is the big culprit. Uh Um, It can carry Lyme disease as well as other diseases. Um, There are also American dog ticks, which in that area do not carry disease at this point, which is really a relief. And then Lone Star ticks are making their way up to New England. So I have not had any patients report having a Lone Star tick bite yet, but we think it's a matter of time. And they carry other diseases. Um, So yeah, I'd love to run through some slides so that we can see the differences. Uh So here you okay, go. shall I do that now? Yeah, yeah that'd please. be great. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I, I'm really passionate about helping people understand um, the differences between these ticks and the way that they look, so that if you get a tick bite, um, you know whether or not it's one of the ticks that carry diseases. So here we have our deer tick, otherwise known as the black-legged tick, or Xodes scapularis. And um, Borrelia burgdorferi is the pathogen, the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. So this is one of the pathogens that it carries that we all hear about mostly, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But also it can carry other pathogens. So actually Vermont was number one for anaplasmosis cases in the country. Um, So it's it's really high risk to be bitten by black-legged ticks in the area because they can carry Lyme as well as anaplasma, as well as some of these other pathogens. Um, so I think that's important to know that um, Babesia and Powassan virus can also be um, carried by black-legged ticks. So you'll see this nice um, reddish tan back 
Um, that's its abdomen. Um, uh -huh. So if we look at tick identification, we actually don't look at that area, although that's what people <laughs> often notice. And when it's an adult tick, you will notice that tan reddish abdomen. So that's okay. easy. However, when uh, you have a nymph, which is the second stage, it's like the teenager tick, um, you're not going to have that tan red. It's going to be black. So it's going to be fully black. Okay. Um, so the better part to identify would be that um, dorsal shield, which is that black part. And now we're going to compare this, and then I'll, I'll come back to that in anatomy a little bit. But let's talk about... Um, Let's talk about the American dog tick. So you can already see how different it looks, at least when you can really look at it, yeah. right? Because yeah. um, they're so small, so they're hard to find and, and really examine. But this American dog tick uh, in other areas, not in Vermont, but they can carry rickettsia, which causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which actually we have down here in Georgia. No. Um, <laughs> so I'm learning, I'm learning a lot. Um, <laughs> but also it can carry in certain areas uh, Francisella, which causes tularemia. Um, but up there, for now, um, ticks don't carry these diseases, and so um, this one will kind of give you a free pass. Mm -hmm. um, so noticing what it looks like, um, that mottled, grayish, whitish dor dorsal shield is the way to identify that tick. Um, so here we go into uh, the anatomy and the differences, seeing them side by side. So, so if you notice that dorsal shield with the deer tick, it's that black, solid black. And then with the dog tick, it is that different sort of mottled uh, whitish um, back, uh, the dorsal shield. So we really want to differentiate those that can help us um, because you can actually send off the tick to get tested to find out if it is carrying any pathogens. And if it is a black-legged deer tick, that's a good idea. And then you'll find out if it was carrying any pathogens and whether you're at risk for that transmission. Huh. Um, now, just to also mention, because we've got to keep our eye out for this one, Lone Star Ticks, which we do have down here in Georgia also, um, but they're making their way up, as it sounds, they're originally found in Texas, and they've made their way up the Northeastern Corridor um, into Connecticut and New York, and now we're seeing more in Massachusetts and even Vermont and New Hampshire. So. Keep an eye out for these. They have that, that uh, dot on their back, um, which is the dorsal shield. Um, so that would be a way to identify them. And as you can see, it's a whole list of other pathogens that we have to yeah. be concerned about. Ehrlichia, uh, which causes ehrlichiosis. Um, and also this alpha-gal syndrome is actually a meat allergy that uh, is not a pathogen, but it's a syndrome that can be created by a reaction that happens mm from um, proteins that are transmitted by the tick saliva. So it's a whole different ball of wax with the Lone Star tick. So just, just a little warning on that one. Hopefully we don't have to um, deal with that too much uh, <laughs> for a while. But um, yeah, so I have some other slides. Um, I know we're at limited time, but you know this is the tick life cycle, and then I'll probably just fast forward through a few so we can take a look at some um, Lyme rashes, but this tick life cycle just gives us an idea of when we see which ticks. So this is about the deer tick, the black-legged tick. It's a two-year life cycle, and so we see larvae come out in the summer. And larvae are the size of a period at the end of a sentence. So they're going to attach to somebody pretty small because they don't have much energy to walk up a piece of grass. Um, so they're going to attach to somebody low to the ground. They're probably in leaf litter. Uh, ticks love to be in moisture and dark, moist places, so that's where they thrive. And so that's who they will probably bite, and that's usually when they get infections. So that's when they get Lyme disease. And then they could transmit it to somebody else once they become nymphs. So that's in the fall, and then we have that nymph um, size that's the size of a poppy seed, still very small, and um, they will be out also then the next year in um, the summertime. So for right now, we're thinking about adult ticks, which are the, the third stage of life and the ones that I showed you with that nice reddish tan abdomen. Um, so we're seeing those, uh, they're sort of the bookends for uh, March, April, May, and then they come back October, November. Um, but soon yeah. we'll be headed, uh, June, July, we'll be headed into the nymph season. So 
we definitely want to keep an, out, an eye out for those smaller nymphs, which are the size of a poppy seed. And that's where all of our really important preventative measures come in. Okay. So I'm just going to skip ahead. Oh, here we can see just how small they are, which you've probably seen, wow. I imagine, before. <laughs> yeah. And then just the comparison between the nymph and the adult. Um, and then here's an egg mass. Scary when they... Um, yeah. put out eggs for the next generation and then a fed tick you know they do yeah. get bigger right so if you find one that's that large like people will find them on their dogs that means they had a, a meal okay. um, but just to just to get through a couple of these um, here's the 2012 map and now we see just how many more cases there were in 2019 Lyme disease is spreading throughout the US and then I did want to just take a moment because there's a lot that's talked about regarding the rash. Like for Lyme, uh, symptoms that you can get after a tick bite would include fever, flu-like symptoms, chills, sweats, uh, new joint pain, new muscle pain, new headaches. These are things to look out for. The list goes on, and you can certainly find that information. We can give you some resources. Um, but the rash does not always happen. It only happens under 50% of the time. There's a lot of research showing this. And I think a lot of the public thinks that if you don't get a rash around the tick bite, we're all good. Um, so really, it's important to be aware of the rash and what it can look like. That's one of the issues. But also to look out for those other symptoms for up to 30 days after a tick bite, because that's going to be important to take note of and to report to your healthcare provider. So here's, say, um, an erythema migrans, which is what the Lyme rash is called. It happens around a tick bite. It can also, you'll see a picture that it can happen throughout the body. Um, but this one is on somebody's back of the shoulder. So they may have missed it. You know, if somebody was not checking themselves in the mirror or have a partner to, to take a look, um, it's important to check that tick bite for 30 days after the, uh, the bite because you may not notice it. It's usually not itchy, inflamed, it, it, it's usually flat, so you may not even notice it. Um, but here are some other pictures, so it can look really different. Uh, it's not always a perfect bullseye. I didn't mm -hmm. even put up the picture of the bullseye because a lot of people see that, and the point is it doesn't have to be a perfect bullseye. So um, these are also ways that it can show up. Um, so the three are looking at right around a tick bite, and then the one on the bottom um, is a disseminated rash. So you can get multiple lesions all over your body. This would be all over and not just around the tick bite. Wow. So that's important to know about. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so um, we can um, certainly take a break from the slides and talk <laughs> a little bit more. Yeah, um, you said that um, the ticks pick up the disease pick up the various pathogens from other things. Is it, is it like animals, mice? I'm yes. trying to, yeah. yeah, they'll first get infected often by the white-footed mouse. Um, and so that's actually a target of one of the preventative measures I talk about, tick tubes. Um, but yes, yeah, so they, they yeah. are born without Lyme disease or anaplasmosis, and then um, they would get their first infection from another animal. Oh, and my other question that came up was, these the ticks are move are like the Lone Star tick and the and the ticks from down south are moving. Is that because of people moving, or is it because of climate, or is it because of animals moving? What's what's causing that? Yeah, there's uh, bird migration definitely plays oh, a role. Okay. Uh, also, uh, as the climate changes, they are finding that they can winter over in places like Vermont and New Hampshire and Canada um, because there's not as cold temperature as there was or deep snow cover as there was. So um, yeah, we're seeing more ticks over uh, the winter as well. And then they survive, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then they can hatch out um, some eggs in the spring and such. So I'm just trying to follow the, the, the tick life cycle. So when you have the little and making sure that I have it correct. So when you have the little the little baby ones, the ones that are just little the little black dots, those don't carry the disease yet. Is that do I am I understanding that, or you yes, still have to be cautious? Yes, and usually they're not going to bite a human because they're not going to move very far. Okay. Um, so it's really once they become nymphs, we see those, and those are carrying pathogens. 
size of a poppy seed. We're going to see those infect people. Okay. And then the adults as well will be carrying pathogens and can infect people. Okay. So can you conceivably like get a tick bite, never know you had one, and then start having symptoms? Yes, that happens a lot too. So 50% of people with Lyme disease do not recall a tick bite. So that's an issue as well. Um, yeah, it can be found later on when somebody notices, hmm, why am I having these odd fevers or joint pains that move around the body and come and go? That's very classic for Lyme disease mm -hmm. symptoms. And they might get tested later on and be found to have Lyme. Okay. And is there, I, th I think that there's, is there a, a are there false positives with Lyme testing, or is there a really good definitive test to say, yes, you have it? There are more issues with false negatives. Okay. Um, the typical testing done uh, is, is not very accurate, actually, and I have some extra training, so I do offer some specialized testing that does bring more sensitivity and specificity, so we can uh, do better testing and really identify if somebody is dealing with Lyme. When we're talking about acute Lyme, we're talking about prevention and ticks, so we're a little bit more talking about acute Lyme today. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, testing is not accurate, any of them. A hospital lab is not going to be accurate until after four weeks from a tick bite. So when somebody comes down with a fever oh. or a swollen knee or a bullseye rash or, you know, Lyme rash, um, this is probably going to have been, you know, first week, second week after a tick bite, something like that, and you can't actually get a, a, an accurate test result on that. Um, and most people are aware of that, but there are some, um, some patients I've seen that they have told me they've been tested before the four weeks after a tick bite, you know, with a fever and joint pain, but they were told, well, you don't have Lyme, which is really, really unfortunate. Yeah. Um, so usually we would initiate treatment at that point because it's really a clinical diagnosis. Um, and a plasmosis, however, that test is accurate and you can do that test early on within the first two weeks. So that's helpful. So just to review some of those symptoms, um, anaplasmosis, usually we're going to see a high fever, like 104, 105, um, also like the worst headache of your life. So a lot of these people go to the ER and they'll get the test and they'll get the treatment that they need, which is doxycycline for two weeks, and it's actually very well treated. It will be horrible to experience while you're experiencing <laughs> it, but then it resolves, you know, and you move on with life. Um, things are a little trickier in the Lyme world uh, regarding testing, regarding proper treatment, et cetera. Um, so, so yes, and now because there's so much anaplasmosis in Vermont, it's really important to know about that. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't, well, I you, did you, know you brought up a really that. good point because <laughs> I have actually, it seems like the treatment has sort of, the treatment has changed over the last maybe eight or 10 years is that they used, I can remember them saying, well, you needed to bring the tick in and they would try to, to test it. But the last time I did this, they just, they just gave me two weeks of the antibiotic and then that was it and um, said they weren't going to test or anything. Um, is, is that changing or is that just sort of, is there a difference between how you approach this than how um, like the conventional ER doctor might approach this? Yeah, well, there is more and more research coming out showing um, when we're talking about persistent Lyme or uh, long-term Lyme or chronic Lyme, there are all these terms people use. You know, there's more research out showing, yes, in fact, 10 to 20% of people um, continue to have symptoms after they are treated for Lyme disease. Oh. And then there's a lot of discussion about, well, why is that? Mm -hmm. um, and so I have been trained through an organization called ILADS, International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society. And um, they are a medical society that look at this other literature showing, hey, there are these different ways that Lyme can exist in the body that can make it difficult to treat. And we need to address all those ways. And actually, there are a lot of studies showing that um, you know, two weeks or three weeks of uh, certain antibiotics may not be enough for certain people to really eradicate the disease. So we need to uh, look at longer treatments as well. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit of uh, a divide, unfortunately, in the medical community. And um, hopefully, we can all get on the same page more and more. Um, 
but I think that's changing, which is very hopeful. Thank so, you. My big question, <laughs> what can you do to never get bitten in the first yeah. place? <laughs> yes, what are some, things, yes, what are some smart are some things? some of my favorite conversations <laughs> because we live in such a beautiful area and, and you live in such a beautiful area. I, I loved hiking in Vermont and being outdoors and you know, the best part of the year is, is just beginning, right? So um, I also work with a lot of farmers and loggers and people who are outdoors a lot. And even just, you know, the love of gardening and being outside. So yes, I want people to be equipped so that you can enjoy being out there. Um, there's a lot that you can do. So um, one of my favorite things is talking about um, the permethrin treatment of socks and shoes. Now, if you just treat your socks and shoes with permethrin, you will decrease your chances of a tick bite by 73 times. Wow. So there's a lot of research on permethrin. Um, so that, that's an awesome one to introduce. Um, if you're already doing tick checks, which are very important, if you're already putting your clothes into the dryer after coming out from the indoor, coming in from the outdoors uh, for six minutes on high, then we need to think about well, what else can you be doing because we want to prevent the ticks from getting on you in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Not just hopefully finding them crawling and taking them off or unfortunately if you find a tick at least maybe you've gotten it sooner than later and pulled it off and we can talk about what to do after a tick bite. But that permethrin is actually a chemical um, made originally from chrysanthemum flower um, but it is toxic to our skin, so we're not spraying it on our skin like a repellent that way. Um, you can and treat materials, like I mentioned, socks and shoes, clothing, gear, like a tent or a backpack. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you do this treatment yourself, it lasts six weeks. So what I recommend, what I do, is I put it on the calendar every six weeks, <laughs> I'm treating the shoes and socks outdoors, spraying them down, um, so go outside, away from kids and pets, spray it down, you can use gloves. Once it's dried into the material, it is safe for us to touch and for pets and kids to be around and to wear. Um, so then, uh, yeah, so then you'll have that protection because when we think about walking outside, even in short grass, the ticks can be there. Mm -hmm. So we have that nice barrier with the shoes um, and the shoes and socks. So. Avoiding things like uh, tall grass and walking in low shrubs, that's all very important, but um, you can also do this treatment, which would be very helpful. Nice. So good. we're down to about two minutes. I know this has gone by right. fast. <laughs> well, I know, it's so, really good, thank you. Um, some closing, any, any salient points that you wanna drive home in the, in the last two minutes? Yeah, well, um, if you want to learn more, I have a book called Preventing Lyme and Other Tick-Borne Diseases. I worked with Story Publishing, and uh, it was amazing to go through that process and get this information out to the public. And in that book, I talk about the ticks, the diseases, the steps to take after getting a tick bite, and prophylaxis, as well as uh, acute treatment. Do you have a slide of that book stuff. cover that you could share with us? Um, yeah, I can share that. And they do carry it at Sojourns. I was just going to ask, might they have that available at Sojourns? <laughs> they do. And, and of course, anywhere you buy books. So it could be the local bookseller in Bellows Falls, as well as um, anywhere you buy books, Amazon and such. Um, so let's there go is. back to, to that one. So this All is right. the slide on the book. Leave and that also up the, um, the tick preparedness kit. Um, and we have those at Sojourn. So that has everything you need um, after a tick bite. So removing the tick with an Otom tick twister, uh, putting some andrographis on the tincture that kills Lyme, and then sending the tick off to a place called tickreport.com to see if it's carrying nice. any pathogens. Starting some herbal prophylaxis with something called deer tick bite formula that I created uh, based on some research that shows its efficacy uh, against these microbes that are carried by a deer tick. And then watching for symptoms um, and re reporting them if they came up in 30 days after the tick bite to your healthcare professional. Great. So yeah, if you need any help, um, we have a tick bite clinic at Sojourns Community Health Clinic. So uh, Dr. Song and myself are the Lyme literate physicians there. And so we, um, 
We talk to people about what to do after a tick bite or if they become symptomatic. I, I'm passionate about this piece of my work to get people uh, access to talking to a professional about that. Great. So That's we are amazing. Thank out of you. time. <laughs> and we're out of time. I want to thank Alexis yes. for um, coming on. You put a, a wealth of information. I'm very pleased. Um, thanks again. And that's it for the Super feed. quickly, though, just oh. one last minute thing. Sojourns is teaming up to possibly get some funding from Target. So if you are a Target Circle member, you can actually vote. You need to vote in the South Burlington area in order to be able to vote for Sojourns. But put your votes in and Sojourns oh, can get some funding. I just told right. Sarah. Yeah, I told great. Sarah I would. I would get that plug yeah. in me in just enough time. Good so, job. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you again. Thank you and for we'll having see, me. I hope you stay tick free. <laughs> oh, me too. <laughs> yes. See everyone next week. Bye. Bye.